welcome. Thank you. Welcome in the name of our great God and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We come together today as God's people, desiring to worship him in the beauty of holiness. We come because we've been accepted in his beloved son. He is our boast. He is our confidence. Welcome. If you turn into the word of God to a passage that we read quite often here, but Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12. For those of you that are uh, mathematically challenged, you'll find that Hebrews 12 comes after Hebrews 11, which is the great chapter of faith. And as you go through those characters, as you go through those people that are held up as, uh, as those of God's people that have had faith, you might be surprised when you read some of their names. As we look upon ourselves also, we too might be concerned with our lack of faith as Rod and I were speaking earlier. But our faith is from God. It is him working in and through us. So after Hebrews 11 comes this passage, Hebrews 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us and were, uh, gave them, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, Lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby may be many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, 
he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. For ye are not come unto the mount that might not might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the great assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also the heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are, are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore we received a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably, with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. And this is the word of the living God to us this day. Let us indeed hear his voice. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord and heavenly Father, we come into your presence this day in and through and because of your beloved Son, the one who hung upon that tree in our place, who shed his blood for the remission of our sins. Lord, we come acknowledging, O oh Lord, that we still strive, that we still struggle, that we have not put aside the sin that so easily besets us. And Lord, we beseech thee and ask that in and through your spirit, Lord, you would conform us to the image of your beloved son, that we might know what it is to live our lives through him, in his power, in his holiness. May it indeed transform each one of our lives and Lord, in the meantime, we ask that you would come and that you would work upon us. Lord, that if chastening is required, that you would chasten us, that we might know that we too are your beloved sons, that you take care of us, that you love us, that you correct us. And Lord, we pray that we may be quick to respond, that we might hear your voice and turn away from those paths that would lead us, O oh Lord, away from you, and into that chastising that would draw us away from uh, our first love. Lord, swell our hearts with gratitude. Keep our eyes fixed upon the living God and his Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Fill us with your Spirit that we might walk in him, and not in the flesh. Lord, be with us this day, we pray, as we worship and we commit ourselves once again into your care. And we ask, Lord, speak to us. Correct us, teach us, lead us and perfect us in your beloved Son, by your Spirit. For we ask all of these mercies, not because we deserve them, 
but because you are merciful and you are gracious and you delight to hear the prayers of your people. We ask these things in and through that blessed name, the name above every name, the name at which every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In his worthy name we pray. Amen. Let us stand and sing our first hymn. Hymn number 778. In heavenly love abiding. 778. Amen. Is that a new one to you, Annie? You mustn't. Shh. Really? Wow. What a beautiful, indeed, what a beautiful sentiment that Jesus Christ himself is our all in all. I think I sing it slowly. I think that's more, more likely. <laughs> Notices, God willing. Uh, again, no meeting this evening. Um, continue to pray for one another, though. Though we may not meet personally, it doesn't stop us from praying for one another. Uh, do pray for those that aren't feeling particularly well. Uh, pray. Keep Karis in your, your prayers. And dear Vicky, not, not feeling totally <laughs> with it today, pray for one another, care for one another, love one another and do that in and through prayer to our God. This coming Thursday, God willing, at seven o'clock, we'll be looking at our sixth, sixth session, our sixth and final session on a time for confidence, confidence in hope. Now, any of you that know the biblical term hope, you know that it is not like the way we use it today. I hope it's going to be sunny tomorrow. The hope and hope when it's spoken of in scripture is assured. It is steadfast. It is without doubt. And that hope is Jesus Christ, that he's coming back for his people, to his people to bring in his glorious kingdom here on earth and for us to live forever with him. A time for confidence, confidence in hope. Let us now come before the Lord in prayer. Let us seek his blessing upon our country at this time that we might live those peaceable lives. And if the Lord doesn't deem fit to answer that prayer, that he would keep us faithful and bold in the proclamation of the truth of his word, because here is where freedom is found. Let us pray. Eternal living God, as we see the change all around us, we just sung that we will not fear because you are beside us. And yet, Lord, how easy it is to forget that as we turn on our televisions or read our newspapers and we see the turmoil of this nation. Lord, a nation that has indeed turned its back upon your word and it wonders why it is in such a state. But Lord, in this time of change, we ask that we might see your hand at work for good, if it be your will upon this land. Lord, we ask for the prime minister that is to be, to bring in laws of righteousness and to stem the tide of evil. Lord, this is their mandate from you. And yet again and again, we have seen how even those in the highest of positions over us in this land have rejected, have rejected you, have rejected your precepts, have rejected the health and the beauty and the life that is to be found in your word. Oh, Lord, that you might touch our leaders by your spirit. Lord, that you would restrain them if they are not yours. 
but more so, Lord, we would ask that you would speak and in your mercy and in your grace that you would call them to yourself, that they might be a means of righteousness within this land. Father, as we think of our political leaders, we also think of our spiritual leaders throughout this land. So many of your shepherds, O God, seem to be hirelings. Lord, they bring messages of peace and acceptance and welcome when you have said it is an abomination. And they have decried, O Lord, against your word regarding holiness and righteousness, and they have called it evil. Lord, have mercy upon the church in this land. And would you raise up leaders and ministers and bishops and archbishops that truly believe in your word and would call this country back to it, to you. Father, we pray in confidence, knowing that all things are done well in accordance with your will. But Lord, we fear also that it is too late. We fear, O oh Lord, that you have cast this land off, that you have fulfilled your warning in Romans 1 to, to give this nation over to a reprobate heart. And if that is the case, O oh Lord, then we pray for your mercy within your church, your true church. We pray, Lord, for your mercy to rest upon each true believer in this land, that we might stand up and be aware of the cost and be willing to pay it, to be faithful to you, to bring life into this dying world, to bring words of light and beauty, to bring Christ. Father, I fear that I do not know how to pray in the circumstances that we see ourselves in. But we do trust in you. We do trust in your word. We do trust in the power of your gospel to convert sinners, to bring those who are dead into life, to bring those who are alienated and who are enemies to you to become friends. Lord, have mercy upon us. We pray for the work and the witness of this, your church here at Bethlehem. We pray for each and every member of this place that we would indeed bear your name well. We pray for all those that come and attend in this place and are associated with us. We pray too for them that they would bear your name well. Lord, hear our prayers, hear our cries, hear the yearning from our hearts, Lord, that we might see your arm at work in salvation in this land still, within our churches still, with our friends and our families still. Lord, in your wrath, remember mercy. Remember your people, that you have set your name upon them and that we bear you in this land. Strengthen us and give us a voice, a bold voice that cares for what you think and how you see us rather than our reputations, rather than anything else. Lord, save us from ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shortly I'm going to ask John if he would come and minister to us in the reading of God's holy word. We will be turning to Romans, Romans, John, the gospel of John and chapter 15. As I was looking through my past sermons, I, I've seen that I haven't actually preached from this passage uh, I think some time ago when we went through the I am sayings of Jesus on a Thursday night, we actually touched on this passage. But this is the first time that I've preached from John 15. And so I'm looking forward to, to learning with you. John, would you come and minister to us in the reading of God's word? Would you lead us in prayer that we might hear, that we might love, that we might cherish and that we might be changed? Thank you. Good morning. 
morning. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, Lord, this morning would you teach us, Lord, from the power in heaven, O Lord, by your spirit, I pray, Lord, that you might bring home your truth to us. Let us not be ignorant, Lord. Let us understand what you'd have us to understand. And let us, O Lord, put these things into practice in our lives. Lord, let us not be unaffected by what we hear. Glorify your name in us, I pray, in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. John 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, and that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch beareth fruit of itself, except it abideth in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, as it withered, and men gathered them and cast them into the fire, and they burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask uh, what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so hath I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abideth in his love. These things hath I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for servants knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that have that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, for I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he shall give you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours, yours also. But all these, all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass, that the world might be fulfilled, that the word might be fulfilled, that it is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness, 
because you have been with me from the beginning. Amen. John 15 is a famous passage of scripture, one that I remember. Um, you'd probably see lots of children colouring in a, a picture of uh, grapes and the vine in a Sunday school lesson. And it is this beautiful metaphor whereby Jesus teaches his disciples and employs a common image to those around Jerusalem. Jesus takes us, as it were, to a vineyard and compares himself to the vine. His eternal father as the husbandman, that's an old fashioned word for, for one that tends the land. I think others might translate it as a vine dresser or farmer or gardener. His eternal father as the hand husbandman or, or tender of the vine. And the branches, well, they represent those who have an association with Jesus. We will look at the vine, the branches and the husbandman throughout this sermon. And we, think, we will also think about what does it mean to bear fruit to the glory of our God. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father. Lord, as we hear your word expanded, we pray, Lord, that you would teach us from it, that your spirit would guide us into all truth. Lord, that you would use these words from this fallible man to bring to your children the truth of your word. Lord, grow us today in Christ, we pray. Amen. I think that's how I would probably entitle this, this sermon, Our Growth in Him. Our Growth in Him. So the setting. Jesus has left the upper room. He's instituted the Lord's Supper. Judas has departed from him. And he is on his way to Gethsemane. He has already told his disciples not to be anxious because he is going away. And now he gives them something more to consider as they walk with their master for those last few earthly hours that they will be with him. Before he goes to his death at Calvary. Christ is about to bring a harvest to God and a fruitful one at that. By his death and resurrection. Josephus, that famous um, historian, reported that one of the significant items that adorned the second temple was a tall golden cluster of grapes. This ornament in the temple has been a traditional symbol of the land of Israel, which had its roots in the report that the spies who were sent to evaluate the land uh, brought back. Do you remember those massive grapes as they come in and they say it's flowing with milk and honey and they have those massive grapes that they bring back and yet the pleas from Joshua and Caleb could not convince the majority to take the land some commentators have suggested that it is as Jesus passes the temple and this image of the, the vine that's growing, some commentators believe that the, this is where he delivers this extended metaphor. In this image, Jesus sets himself up as the vine. What is a vine? Is it something that you grow for kindling? Not really. Is it something that you grow, you know, like we can with the hedges? Not really. It has one purpose, really, a vine. One purpose. <laughs> to, to give fruit. 
when they're well tended, they can look quite pretty, but that's not its function. It is to produce fruit. And Jesus represents himself as this vine. The vine is the part of the plant that is rooted in the earth. And from it delivers all of the nutrients and energy that that plant needs to grow. Without the vine, you have no branches. Without a living vine, you have no life. You have no sap. You have no fruit. The vine feeds the branches and the fruit with its life-giving sap. A healthy vine is a, is a sight to behold, full of fruit. And here, this is what Jesus associates himself with. For he is the one that brings all that is needed for the branches to flourish and bear fruit. In the Old Testament, the image of the vine is a common symbol for Israel, the covenant people of God. And one of the remarkable things about the usage of the vine metaphor in connection with Israel in the Old Testament is the fact that whenever historic Israel is under the figure, it is the vine's failure to produce good fruit that is emphasised. Along with the corresponding threat of God's judgment upon the nation. Now in contrast to such failure, Jesus claims, I am. The true vine. I am the one whom faithful Israel received their lifeblood from. I am the one that you will receive your energy and life from. I am the one that all whom are truly connected to me throughout the ages will receive their life from. I am the true vine. I wonder where it is that we draw our life from. I wonder the substitute vines that we might wish ourselves grafted into. Work. Our reputations. But what is it that drives us? And I think you will find that ultimately the sap that is needed for a Christian life cannot be sourced from those false vine, vines. I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Jesus now speaks or will come to speak of the branches and we will notice that there are several designations given to these branches. There are branches that are somehow connected to Jesus and yet do not bear fruit. And then there are branches that have a living, a vital relationship with Jesus that do bear fruit. Verse 2, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, talking about the husbandman. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. In verse 2, that we, we see a teaching that is, not only instructive, but also a warning. We see these two groups that are united to Jesus in some way, and yet we are warned of two different outcomes to their connection with him. The first group, who do not bear fruit, the father cuts away. And taking verse 6 into consideration, their destiny is heading towards being cast forth and gathered into the fire and burned. 
the second group that does, does bear fruit is heading towards pruning. The husbandman takes this vital job seriously. He is the one who carefully planted the vine and waters and feeds the vine. He is the one who cares for, looks after and watches over the vine and the branches. He is the one who prunes and purges, cleans and protects the vine and its branches. For all good vine dressers know that you prune it to stop it wasting its energy and being unproductive. You, you cut out, particularly the plants of the uh, parts of the plant that are growing inwards, getting tangled up. And you encourage those shoots that are growing outward and toward the light. Because left to themselves, they will produce a lot of unnecessary growth, which will need to be cut away if it is truly to be what it is capable of. This is what our Heavenly Father does to all that he loves. He prunes those elements in our characters and in our lives that will, if left unattended, cause that person, cause us to grow inward and deformed and unproductive. This is the way in which our Heavenly Father attends and cares for us, that we might be as beautiful and as life-giving as is his Son. There was another picture, wasn't there, given in Hebrews 12 that we read earlier, of correction, of scourging, and yet the ideas are the same. The correcting of our lives, the cutting away of that old man, that old person that once delighted in sin. And the father takes his knife and he cuts. But we each know that this can be and often is painful as he cuts away those old habits those old ways of thinking and behaving. As one commentator puts it, the vine dresser is never closer to the vine, taking more thought over its long-term health and productivity than when he has the knife in his hand. But immediately after these words, these words that come from Jesus' mouth, so too does the words of comfort to his disciples. Verse 3, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Here Jesus allays their fears or any fears that these disciples might have, especially when we realise that they will soon be reunited with one of the disciples who had occupied a position within the inner circle who shall shortly come back into their view with a band of guards to betray and to arrest Jesus. Surely here is a branch that has been connected to Jesus and yet does not abide in him, doesn't receive his life from him. It's an external connection, an outward connection. Like many people that come to church week in and week out, sit under the preaching of God's word, even if it's faithfully preached, and yet they're not vitally connected to Christ. Externally, outwardly, you might say, yes, they're a Christian. They come to church every week and yet they do not know of the forgiveness of their sins. They do not know of repentance and obedience and 
what the blood of Christ has done for all those for whom he has died. Connected and yet not connected, just like Judas. But these words of comfort to the true disciples, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. As the disciples think back upon this, do you remember their response as Jesus sits at the table and says, one of you will betray me? They don't all turn to Judas and say, we knew it. They say, Lord, is it me? Am I going to betray you? But here Jesus calms their fears. You are clean. You are clean because my word has cleansed you. You believe. You trust in my words. You follow after as true disciples. You are true branches that produce fruit. He tenderly tells them that they're clean, that they have been cleansed by his word, that they trust in his word. And as these events unfold, they, unlike Judas, are vitally connected to Jesus, as verse 4 expands upon. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, Except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. Abide. Abide is the word that brings life here. It is not enough to just be somehow attached to Jesus. It isn't about showing your baptism card or your confirmation card because you can be attached to him in that way and yet not vitally not living not abiding in him no abide has the idea of remaining with living with or living in i think we could understand this term as being a true disciple of the true vine. And this abiding has everything to do with the fruitfulness, as Jesus goes on to explain. To abide in Jesus is to bear fruit in our lives. As the master husbandman cuts away the redundant and damaging growth in our lives, as he prunes us into the image of his true vine in order that the differentiation between the vine and the branch is indistinguishable to abide is to grow to grow in our character and in our lives into the image of the only begotten this is the growth driven by the pulsating life of the vine in the branch. And only this kind of growth produces fruit. No branch has life in itself. To be cut off from Christ, to be cut off from the vine, the true vine, is death. No branch has life in itself. It is utterly dependent for life and fruitfulness to the vine to which it is attached. The living branch is thus truly in view. The living branch is in the vine. The life of the vine is truly in the branch, as D.A. Carson puts it. Jesus now expands upon this idea of fruit in a believer's life. Fruit that is produced because it is truly and vitally connected to the vine. Verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. 
He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Before Christ, by the Spirit, entered into my life, I could choose him, not according to this verse. Before Christ entered into my life, I had the ability to please God, not according to this verse. Without me, ye can do a few things poorly, but you can do nothing. Outside of the vine, there is no life. That's how the scriptures can say that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. You can do nothing. So what is this fruit that we read of here? I know many a Christian that fears over this very text that should encourage us. Many are tempted to narrow the meaning of this term to a singular item. Most, if pushed, would probably state that bearing fruit is the activity and success of our gospel heralding. That it is bringing people to Christ or however we might term the idea of seeing others that God has used us uh, to bring them to himself. And although I believe that this indeed is a fruit I do not believe that it is the only idea that Jesus has in mind. It is far too reductionist. The fruit that is mentioned here, a fruit that can only be obtained by abiding or living in Christ, is nothing less than the outcome of pres preserving dependence on the vine. Driven by faith, embracing all of the believer's life and the product of their witness. Not just in their gospel witness, but as Annie rightly said on Thursday, was it? That our lives themselves should show forth Christ. That is fruit. Think about how the idea of fruit is used throughout the New Testament. I'm just going to go through a few passages, not all of them. Romans 1, 13. Now, this is Paul speaking. Now, I would not have you ignorant. Notice this word, brethren. Who's he speaking to? The believers in Rome. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oft times I purpose to come unto you, but was hindered hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Who's he speaking to? He's not saying, I want to do an evangelistic rally in Rome, and that's why I'm coming. The fruit that he speaks of here seems to be expected within the believing community. Romans 6, verses 21 and 23. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? Your old life. What fruit did it produce? For the end of those things is death, but now being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness. And the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What is the fruit of unto holiness, unto eternal life? Romans 7 verse 4, wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye, sh that ye should be married to another, 
even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. That we should bring fruit unto God. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against there is such, there is no law. In all of these passages, fruit has to do with far more than just making converts. In fact, I don't even think that that is its primary function in all of these verses. Rather, it has the idea of a life that is conformed to the image of Christ. A life that has been changed, not from effort driven by the human will to fit in and outwardly look the part. But rather driven by the life force of abiding in Christ. Outside of him, we can do absolutely nothing. Nothing that would conform to to true fruit. When out of our own will and our own effort and our our own life, fallen life, we try and produce fruit, the best that we can do is the fruit that you see in Ikea. As you go past and you see those lovely apples that are there that look so juicy and tasty and you pick one up, not to steal it, but just to admire it and you realise it's polystyrene. It's fake. It's not real. It's not fruit. Unto God. And when we drive and when we are driven by our our internal, our fleshly energies, that's the kind of fruit we produce. It might look good from the outside, but you wouldn't want to eat it. Outside of Christ, outside of the vine, We can do absolutely nothing, nothing that would conform to true fruit. As Jesus tells us, without me, you can do nothing because no branch can bear fruit of itself from within itself unless it is connected to the vine. We spoke last week, didn't we, about the unity or the uniting of the believer to Christ. Well, here is a very vivid picture, isn't it? Where does the vine stop and the branch begin? Well, it's easy if you see the sellotape that's wrapped around it. And that branch truly doesn't belong. But organically, the true church of Christ is so attached to him that it should be indistinguishable from him. Do we know of this fruit in our own lives? Can we see our Father at work in us, pruning us, conforming us? Do we see the fruit of the Spirit growing larger and larger in our lives? I always admire Charlotte's tomatoes, how they start off as these tiny little things. And yet as the rain comes down and and, and they pulls from its it, it well its vine it pulls the, everything that it needs to grow and to swell is that our experience in Christ some of us are indeed swelling but it's not necessarily by the fruit of the spirit <laughs> overindulgence maybe in my part But is it the fruit of the spirit that swells us and grows us and changes us? Do we see the fruit of the spirit growing larger and larger in our lives? Do we see the swelling of this fruit? Do we see love flourishing in our hearts? Seeking the good of those around us? Do we experience joy swelling up in us as we abide in Christ? Are we disciples of peace, of long-suffering, 
of gentleness. And the easiest way to determine this is to ask a, a trusted friend. Do you see a change in my character as I abide in Christ? Do you see the evidence of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness in my interactions with you and with others? Do you see goodness, faith, meekness and temperance growing in my life? Because if you are truly and vitally connected to Christ, then these are the fruit that his life in you will grow in you. So much so that there will be an abundant harvest for others to come and see that the Lord is good. To come and taste. Taste from you the beauty of the Lord. To abide in Christ is to be transformed. To be vitally connected to Christ through repentance and faith will bear fruit in your lives. Fruit in your lives that will be seen by others all around you. But a branch that is trying to live out its life apart from the vine, without a connection to Christ, will feel the stress of trying to conform to the way of life and growth that it just cannot sustain. What happens to that tomato plant? If you make a mistake in the pruning, you can pop the branch next to it, shove it in the compost, and sometimes you'll see it starting to produce, but it never comes to full fruition. There just isn't enough life in and of itself to produce fruit. There may be the flower and the start, but it never comes through. So is it to claim to be a Christian and not to be united to the true vine. You might look like a tomato plant. You might even flower on occasions like a tomato plant, but you're dead and there is no life. Trying to live out this kind of life apart from the vine, without a connection to Christ. And you will feel the absolute crushingness and the stress of trying to conform to something that you just cannot live out. For you have no vitality in and of yourself. No how matter how hard you try, the nutrients are just not there to produce fruit. And yet so often this is the way that we try and live out our Christian lives. We're vitally connected to Christ and yet where do we place our confidence? We rely upon our own skill sets our own natural tendencies in the way we live, and then we view that as fruit. No. Fruit only comes from sharing in the life-giving vine. And to live our lives in this manner, we must take verse 6 as a warning to ourselves and repent and trust in Christ's life in us to produce the fruit rather than trying to produce it ourselves. To produce fruit that is pleasing to God and brings him glory. Verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And man, men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. 
concluding this whole section today. Here our abiding means a life of prayer and a life saturated by God's word. Have you ever considered your fruit in the light of these two things? Have you considered that the health of the fruit that you produce in Christ is proportionate to these means of grace in your lives? If my fruit was measured by my prayer life or my engagement with God's word, I wonder how confident I would be regarding my abiding in Christ. I wonder how confident you would be in the fruit of your lives if this was the measure of your fruit towards God. But take rest in these facts that our life, our vital life comes from Christ. He supplies all that we need to be obedient and fruitful. He does it all as he works in us by his spirit. Be encouraged as God our Father takes his knife to our lives and we feel the sharpness of that blade cutting away at the old dead wood of our lives and sculpts us as he prunes us away to be conformed, to share in the life and the image of his beloved son. Take rest in this, that Christ abides in you as we abide in him. We cannot force this abiding, neither can we attach ourselves to him in a casual or false manner. No, his life is in us and flows through us. It is our life. And therefore we will produce fruit because he himself is life. And we are attached to him vitally and securely if he has grafted us in. In this passage we find the principles of our spiritual lives. We must be abiding in Jesus. We must be trusting in his life in order to live our own. And this is a constant challenge and one that we need God's empowerment to be able to live. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray indeed that that knife would indeed be in your hand and that you would cut away all that which mars and deforms us. Lord, let that vital union with Christ be the strength and the source of our life and our fruit, that we might be pleasing to you. Father, forgive us, O Lord, where your fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, seems to be malnourished, seems, O Lord, to be just hanging in on there. Lord, would you take your words today and would you confront us with the reality of our lives before you, that we might know with assurance that we aren't branches just casually laid up against the vine, but that we are part of the vine itself. Lord, it is only through your grace and your mercy, it is only through you grafting us in, that we have any hope of that fruit of eternal life, that fruit of holiness. For it is your life flowing through us that causes all of this. Lord, challenge us, strengthen us and encourage us. Let us leave this place. Let us leave this place, O oh Lord, desiring to see the fruit of your spirit at work in our lives that we might bring glory to your name. For it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Let us turn to our hymn books and sing 852. 852. Abide with me, fast falls the even tide. 
The darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When others help us fall and comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. 852. Please remain standing for the benediction. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. And the children of God say, Amen. Amen.